Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Beyond the Yellow Tape. My name is Nadi and we have Julian. Um, I am really, really excited because we have recorded this episode after quite a long time. So yay. Uh, but we also have another exciting news to share. Um, I recently um, had my PhD thesis defense and I passed my defense. Um, so fingers crossed. Um, hopefully in May 2024, I'll have my doctorate degree. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone who heard about my story. And thanks to Julian for letting me do this. It's been a very wonderful um, and exciting year, 2023. And we have a few interesting things coming up by the end of December as well. So stay tuned. Um, coming to this episode, uh, we are talking a lot about forensic tox toxicology. Um, so the person, um, the guest that we have for today's episode um, is from John Jay University, in New York. Um, so I will let uh, Julian um, introduce the guest. So I'll then I'll stop talking. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so today we have a very special guest. But first off, congratulations, Nitty. And uh, we'll be waiting for that day. So, you know, we love him, you know, the Beyond the Yellow Tape family always, uh, you know, ascends. So that's great news. But um, today we have a very special guest. We have a Dr. Conchero Guzan, a uh, professor at John Jay. She's a, she has a PhD in toxicology from the University of Santiago in Spain. She's currently the program director for John Jay's forensic science grad program. And again, she's an associate professor of toxicology. She has a plethora of awards and fellowships. She has tons of honors, over 10 completed grants and contracts and countless peer reviewed publications so enough for that let's get on with the episode but before guys remember to like share, share and subscribe, and, subscribe. <laughs> and let's get to the episode peace all right hey guys here we are with dr conchero guzan and uh so we'll get right into it so uh, can you define for us what toxicology is and what the role of a forensic toxicologist is of course yeah so actually toxicology is, is very broad, okay? So because toxicology basically, you know, is in the name, toxic and is the, what is harmful and logic is like the knowledge of that. So basically we study all kinds of toxics that could be to human beings, could be to the environment, could be to any kind of organisms. So that's why toxicology is very broad. So we have environmental tox, molecular biotox, we have forensic tox, right? So we have all these branches. So in my case, I'm focused on forensic tox. So it's the study of these harmful effects of different kinds of substances. But when this is going to have an impact, it's going to produce an impairment that is going to have a consequence that is in the medical legal setting um, is going to have a consequence because of that, right? So it's basically to study any kind, but I'm going to say any kind includes since mm -hmm. water to hard drugs of abuse, anything that may produce any kind of effect on the human being that will have a medical legal consequence. So it's, it's still very broad, but it's narrowing to the forensic sciences size. Mm, okay, okay. And um, so I, I'll let you get the next one, Nitty. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any, um, could you explain a little bit about a lot of times in toxicology, they use the word metabolite. Um, so would you mind explaining us and breaking down as to what that means um, and how does that word come into forensic toxicology? Of like, course, yeah, you know? happy to do that. So yeah, so actually that's the thing. So we were saying that toxicology, right? We study the effects of this to toxic or potential, potentially toxic substances on the human being. So because of that, there's this definition, actually toxicology is very linked with pharmacology because pharmacology will be that of any medicines that we can take, right? So toxicology, we basically focus more on the, where everything can go wrong, right? Uh, but it's, it is a, a very, very close link with pharmacology. And I'm bringing that to link with, you are asking about metabolites, right? Uh, because then we have to, to know how the drugs behave in the body. 
So we need to know pharmacology of the drugs. So the, the metabolites is a way that our organism has to make anything that we take not harmful and to basically be able to eliminate that from the body as soon as possible. This is how our body works. We take something, it, we may get an effect, but the body wants to get rid of it as soon as possible, right? So uh, all our blood uh, is going to go through the liver, okay? Because the liver, if you want to think about it, is like a big filter of our blood, right? To purify it a little bit when it's going throughout the body. So when this is happening, when the blood is going through the liver, the metabolism is going to happen. So in this reaction, it's a chemical reaction at the end of the day, the drug that we consume is going to have some chemical modifications with the goal to make it more polar. And why is that? Because the more polar it is, the faster it will be eliminated through the urine. So the product of this metabolism is what we call the metabolites. So when we consume something, it's going to go through the metabolism. And I was telling about the liver because it actually is the main organ where the metabolism is happening. It doesn't mean that it's the only place where it's happening because there are enzymes also in the blood and in the guts and in other parts, but it's the main one. And they're going to produce these metabolites that is a, in many cases, non-pharmacologically active. So the drug is not active anymore. Not always, but many times. And also, as I said, they are more polar. So then it's going to be easier to go through the kidneys and definitely get into the urine to be eliminated. So this is this is a concept of metabolite. So does mm -hmm. it matter the um the way in which the drug was administered for it to uh, be thrown out of the system and be converted into a metabolite? Mm -hmm. um, or it has no correlation of the administration and uh, the removal of the drug from the body. Yeah, of course. No, that's a great question. And actually, yeah, there is an effect depending on how you consume the drug, right? In pharmacology, we'll say how is the route of administration. We know because we all went to the doctor, right? You took medicines orally or sublingual, or an injection, or a patch. So we know that we can consume substances in a different manner. And all these different ways we introduce the drug in the body is going to have an effect on the metabolism that we are we were talking. All of them, regardless of the route, it's true. They are going to go through metabolism. But there are some ways we introduce the body the drug in the body that actually this metabolism is going to be more intense. So for example, when we consume something orally, this is going to be the route where the most intense metabolism is going to happen. And why? Because you, you have to think about it. I mean, our body is super smart, actually. It's a very sophisticated system, right? That many aspects are covered. So the, the other route obviously is how we eat food, how we drink, how we do many things, right? Mm -hmm. So when we consume all that, it's going through our uh, uh, gastrointestinal system and finally it's absorbed in the gut. All that blood from the gut before going to the whole system goes to the liver. Is what is called the first step metabolism, right? So then, all that blood will go through the liver before going to the rest of the body. That means that any drug that you are consumed orally before reaching your brain, your heart, or any other part, first is going to encounter the liver. So a certain percentage of that drug is going to get metabolites already. So then less active dose actually is going to reach the other target oh. and the organism. Right. Wow. So imagine that you take some substance that a, a 60 percent of the drug is going actually to get metabolites in the in the liver before going to the rest of your system. So of whatever dose you take, just the 40 percent of it will reach the target organ that when we talk about forensic toxicology, 
the vast majority is going to be the brain because the vast majority are psychoactive substances. So then just a, a small percentage is going to reach, okay? Other routes, for example, if you inject a substance, you're already putting everything in your bloodstream. So then it's going to reach the target very quickly without going to any kind of metabolism at first. So you are going to have more rapid effect because there is no weight, right? When you take in the oral route, you know, when you eat food, it takes about a couple of hours that it goes through the system, at least partially. In the IV, it's not. Everything is fast. And then it doesn't have that first uh, pass metabolism, right? Mm. Uh, there are other routes, for example, if you put something beneath, uh, underneath your tongue, is the sublingual, actually will also part of it go through the first part uh, metabolism. So there, you know, depending on the way you take the substances, may be affected by that, but orally, it will be the one that you, I will say, lose most of the dose <laughs> that you consume. And actually, right. there is an, an important parameter in toxicology and pharmacology that is called the bioavailability. That means of all the drug you take, how much actually is going to be in your bloodstream. And normally, the oral route is the one that shows the lowest bioavailability because you have to digest the drug to absorb it and first going through the liver. So, mm. yeah. Makes sense. Um, yeah. Would you mind elaborating on uh, classes or like types of psychoactive drugs that usually in forensics uh, we encounter the most and what are the routes of the administration that you have seen so far? Just a brief. Well, you, you can't imagine. People, I know. <laughs> people do incredible. <laughs> Even things that you never thought about it. I, I remember one that got my attention. I mean, it was already severe, several years ago. There was this weird phase where some people were actually being exposed to ethanol. So basically to alcohol instead of drinking. That obviously is the route that everybody knows to the eyeball. So they were adding shots and then opening the eye because then whatever you absorb through the eye is basically a very rapid absorption. Yeah. So they were putting like a shot on their eye and drinking that way. I mean, it was insane, but <laughs> you know, Jeez. it was, yeah, yeah. You, it, it, people, Why would you do that to your body? Just... I don't know. It's, I'm so, you know, it's, I guess that it's much nicer to drink. <laughs> <laughs> something that has a nice flavor instead of producing you know like a damage <laughs> to your eye but you you know incredible things uh, happen but yeah no but definitely I mean there they are uh, classic ways of uh, consuming certain substances and then oh, you have a, a wide uh, range of, of uh, different alternatives right so for example I mean talking about the most common substances let's talk about cannabis right so cannabis, uh, and nowadays is every, in every news because the legalization status is changing mm -hmm. drastically throughout the country, and and obviously this uh, means that in I mean normally more it will be the the use will be more spread right. So in any case, the classic way of consuming cannabis is smoking. Okay, and smoking is a route that actually produces very fast effects because when you smoke, it's going directly to your lungs. And as you can imagine, the lungs have a lot of blood, right? Because this is the way we have to remove the carbon dioxide we have in our blood and get the oxygen and basically being alive. So our lungs are full, full of blood. So definitely when you smoke something and it is not affected by this first pass metabolism that I was talking before. So whenever you smoke something, it's, not, it's always very close to injecting something. You get the effects very quickly and you get your blood levels very quickly. So uh, cannabis is the way that it has been traditionally used, right? But we know that nowadays there are a lot of edibles, right? They're using cannabis in gummies, in chocolate, cookies, you name it, 
You have all right. kinds of edibles. But in the edibles, it's more tricky because there is going to be a delay because when you eat all this stuff, it's going to go through your stomach, your gut before it gets absorbed, it's going through the first part metabolism and then it's going to your blood and then producing the effects. So this is tricky and saying because when some, something is a smoke, like we were saying with the cannabis, they, normally the users are able to control how much are getting because they are getting the effects very quickly. So if they get very dizzy or they get, you know, that they are not the effects that were desired, they stop for a while and then they wherever may be continue or not. However, when you eat, there is going to be one or two hours of delay until you actually get the effects. So sometimes we saw cases of intoxications that happened the people were not patient. So they, they took whatever uh, edible, did not see effects and need more, more and more. And then all of that few hours later, it was too much, right? Mm -hmm. So then this, this, uh, this is how with a very common substance, you can see very similar effects um, in some ways to have a higher risk of uh, overdosing in a way uh, when you take one one way or the other the drug. Another very common substance is cocaine, right? Uh, especially in New York, I can tell <laughs> that is a is a big it's a big issue. And cocaine, the common root is snorting. Okay. Can also be a smoke. It was the crack situation, even can be injected, but the 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 most common route is snorting. And snorting is also very quick set because again, this region uh, snorting, it will be through the nose, inhalation, and all this uh, region has also a very rich blood supply. And also the effects will be felt very, very quickly, okay? Um, then uh, you have, uh, unfortunately, the opioids that are uh, also in the news since already several years with the terrible crisis we're going through. And opioids, uh, I mean, they have can be used different routes. In many cases, is injection, okay, with the goal of feeling or having this initial rush that is described uh, with the opioids. But you know that nowadays, uh, many of the typical supply opioids used to be heroin, and nowadays is more fentanyl that, as you know, is much more potent than fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And since uh, this route of uh, exposure with injection is so quickly, the risk of overdose is, is very high. And also the people, there is no time to react when they get the overdose by inject injection because everything happens so so quickly, right? So, I mean, these are examples of the, I mean, I was thinking amphetamines, we also have the amphetamines, or amphetamines, you, again, you can use them in different ways. Uh, people use them in different ways. I would say orally maybe is one of the most common ones in form of pills, but also can be a snort, I mean, as I said, there is a an incredible <laughs> variability in this mm -hmm. in this situation. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Um, back to the whole, I guess, metabolite concept. Um, can you just give us an example of what maybe alcohol, cannabis, uh, or like an amphetamine, like what their metabolite is? And you also talked about polar. Can you also? Well, what what do you mean by when you say polar? Of course, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, let me start with the polar definition. So, I mean, polar is a, a chemistry concept that is to a, explain how a certain compound, a certain substance is easily dissolved in, in water. I mean, to simplify it in a way, right? Mm -hmm. So when it's polar, it's going to be very easy to dissolve in water. When it's non-polar, we like more something that is more uh, like an organic solvent, right? And it will be more difficult to get dissolved in water. 
So the drugs uh, uh, that we work with, they have many different chemical properties. And sometimes this is uh, uh, because I didn't clarify that at the very beginning when you guys were asking about what is toxicology. And I said forensic tox. And actually, you know how science is? There is always subclassifications of the subclassifications until right. you get a very specific field. So one important thing that we do in forensic toxicology is analysis, is the chemistry, is we do this analytical chemistry part of the job that is analyzing all these compounds to quantify them, to be able to identify what is in the sample and how much. That's why we need to know their chemistry. We need to know if they are polar, if they are non-polar, if they are acid, if they are basic. So we know how we can extract them, how we can analyze, analyze them, identify them, quantify them, right? And I was bringing up the polar concept before, as you were saying, because of the metabolism. I was saying that the, the metabolites in general are more polar. That means that they get better dissolved in water. Right. That means the urine is, is mainly water. So basically they can be eliminated better there. Mm. So in talks, we know a lot about metabolites because I was saying before, we analyze all these drugs and metabolites in different biological samples. And this is going to give us a lot of information. It's going to tell us sometimes making the ratio of the parent drug and the metabolite can tell us if the, the drug exposure was very recent within a few hours, or it was like almost the day before. It, it can tell us information that just looking for the pattern we won't be able to get. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Let's start with ethanol, right? Ethanol, super common. Everybody call it alcohol, the chemical right. name. The alcohol we consume is ethanol, okay? Other ones are much more toxic. Methanol will make you blind, so never try methanol, <laughs> right? So we have to be very careful about that. But in any case, ethanol is a very, very volatile substance and it disappears very quickly from the body, okay? Obviously, it stays there for a while and it can be detected in blood and in urine, but in a few hours, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So if you need, you know, to monitor, to monitor drug use, sorry, alcohol use by somebody, for example, a typical case will be, it will be more clinical, but it will be in a liver transplant, okay? They want to guarantee because sometimes, unfortunately, it happened that when uh, people have alcoholism and they damage the liver, so then they will need to go through a liver transplant. But obviously, uh, the medical doctors want to guarantee that if you get a new liver, <laughs> you won't you know, have the same right. issue in the future. So they want to make sure that you stop drinking, right? So they are going to run different tests on you to make sure that this is the case. And for that, there is uh, there are different metabolites of ethanol that stay much longer in the body that can tell us if somebody has been using alcohol last month, few weeks ago, okay? Mm. Not just yesterday. Because even if you have a problem with alcohol, you can stop drinking for a day. You get your breath test or your blood test and you are good, but actually it's not true, right? So then, uh, as an example, there is a, a minor metabolite of uh, ethanol that is called the ethan ethyl glucuronide that actually accumulates in hair, okay? So if, if because of that, you are able to detect alcohol use on a person potentially like few months ago, or even depending on how long is your hair, could be even a year, okay? Mm. So give you a much wide window. So knowing how the metabolites are formed, how they accumulate, give us a lot of tools, depending on the case, to understand uh, what is happening and to be able to answer the question that we have to. Mm, okay, okay. I never knew that an ethanol metabolite lasts that long in your hair. Yeah, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, look at night. It's crazy, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 um you could you could take it from here Nidhi. okay <laughs> uh as we are talking so much about um liver and liver being like a major part for metabolism 
Um, are there, you talked about uh, that there are different organs as well where metabolism happens. Would you mind shedding some light as to giving like an example like you gave with ethanol, like another drug which metabolizes in a very different uh, way other than the liver and like has a metabolite that uh, dissipates faster, but then you can still detect it, but not through liver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I also you are saying like another examples of important metabolites that we yeah. can monitor. Well, I mean, is <laughs> there are plenty. Let me think. I mean, the ethanol. I like that example because ethanol disappears so fast, and we have these other alternatives that always caught my attention. Um, then, for example, um, let me see. Well, we have, I mean, then there are drugs that actually they don't, they don't produce such a huge amount of metabolites or they still the patent drug is going to be there. Okay. So for example, we have the methadone, right? The methadone is used to treatment of a opioid use disorder. And, uh, and it, it obviously metabolizes in the body, but always the concentration of methadone that you find is going to be higher. So in that case, it's important to know the metabolism. It's important to include the metabolites to understand uh, if actually there was an exposure and so forth, but it won't be that dramatic effect as we described for ethanol. Then, for example, we have another dramatic, if I will say, metabolite that is cannabis. Okay, we talk about cannabis. The psychoactive compound in cannabis is the delta 9 theta hydrocannabinol. And that compound, uh, the delta 9 theta hydrocannabinol, or how we can say in toxicology, delta 9 THC, just we like the short forms of the long chemical names. So the THC goes through metabolism and uh, there is one metabolite that is the carboxylic, the carboxy uh, uh, THC that actually uh, stays in the body for a long time, okay? Uh, so in the case of the cannabis, I would say that is in the THC, is a combination of a long, I would say in a pharmacological term, long half-life, that it means for how long basically is going to, to be uh, your concentration that is in your body will be reduced to the half, okay? So we, uh, these compounds, they have a long half-life. So basically they stay for very long time in the body. So this is one thing. But another thing to keep in mind about the, the cannabis is that also the THC itself and linking with the chemistry of the compound is very non-polar, it's very lipophilic. That means that likes fat, right? Mm -hmm. So accumulates in your fat. So it may happen that you are a cannabis user, the THC throughout the time accumulates in your fat tissue and you stop smoking. And then after whatever amount of time, you lose a weight. So the, the THC that was accumulated in your fat is released to your blood, is metabolized to the carboxy. So even months later, Wow. You go to do a, a drug test and you are positive. And you're like, I swear. I mean, I <laughs> oh my God. Cannabis in, in the last month and you are still positive. Okay. Especially if this happened, not, I mean, frequent users would be weird. It would be very rare. But in chronic users, people that smoke at least five joints per day during whatever amount of months, this is a reality that may happen. So then, uh, that's why you need a toxicologist to do the interpretation of that urine test that became positive, and the uh, subject is swearing that is not using cannabis for a long time. Mm. So you need to see their other metabolites ratios, and and sometimes it helps when you have information from different biological samples. So it will help you. It's like a puzzle. So you put all the pieces there. The more you have, the clearer is the picture. So we'll help you to to understand what is happening. That's so interesting. Wow. Um, yeah, as we crazy. talked a little bit about like half life, which you explained us, um, there's also kind of a concept called the steady state. Um, 
would you mind explaining us as to what that concept means and how that falls in toxicology? Yeah, of course. Yeah, actually, I will say the steady state is a more uh, in the pharmacological realm because it is um, basically the steady state is when you are having a certain treatment and to be able to be effective that treatment, obviously you need to have certain blood levels, okay? Depending on the condition, you may need to keep those blood levels constantly at a certain concentration. Imagine that you have some kind of a severe epilepsy or other treatment that you really need to have certain blood concentrations all the time to avoid, you know, to have a convulsion or to have some arrhythmia in your heart or something like that, right? So then there is, um, a, I mean, I'm laughing because I study pharmacy, actually, I went <laughs> to the pharmacy school. So it brings back my memories of <laughs> for the pharmacology class. So there is certain dosage regimes that you can get you there are certain ways to doing all these calculations depending on the condition of the patient and so forth or how much dose you have to give every certain time to always keep constantly those levels within the therapeutic range so then when you start dosing the patient is going up 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 until reaches that steady state so basically you have to know when it's going to drop to a certain value, then you have to do the next dose and then we'll keep within the band that you want, that is the therapeutic range. So this will be the concept of a steady state. So for the drug to be active and like do its task, you have to keep it at a particular dose for a constant span of time. Exactly. I mean, I mean, it happens a lot because, for example, a uh, one methadone, right? We talked about that before. So methadone, uh, the people that are with treatment of methadone, they have to have a certain concentration all the time, because if it drops below that, they will trigger the withdrawal syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. So then, a uh, one of the fantastic things about methadone, and that's why it's so popular in therapeutics, in, in opioids uh, use disorder, because first of all, has a great oral viability. So you can, I mean, the, the most common way is to drink it, right? When the people go to the clinic, they give it a, a little tap and they drink it. So then basically most of the dose will reach your blood, what is fantastic. You don't have to inject it. It will be just orally. And also that has a very long half-life. So even if you take just one dose per day, you can keep that steady state. So oh, you don't man. have to be dosing every five hours, every 10 hours. You can do every 24 hours. And you, I, I don't know my, <laughs> I don't know what happened with my, my Zoom. I started to do weird things I talk and do like, you know, <laughs> this is pop up. The worst thing was the other day talking with my parents. I said something fantastic and then I got fireworks oh. it was <laughs> I was like this is crazy do you have a Mac I do have a Mac yeah I think it's it's the updated version of Mac but it recognizes your fingers like the way you do like if you do uh, this is, it shows you like yeah a... I did thumbs up yeah. and then for the fireworks I was like what's <laughs> happening <laughs> oh my god yeah I thought artificial intelligence this is scary <laughs> <laughs> crazy but in any case going back to the methadone so uh, yeah so that's uh, so that's the thing so just with one dose uh, normally I mean always we talk about average right then there are people that may be different because of different issues but on average just with a one dose every 24 hours you will keep within that therapeutic range so it won't trigger the withdrawal and the people will be in that steady state Mm. Um. So, sorry, you can go, Julia. I'll go. Oh, yeah. So, does that steady state concept have anything to do with like a person's tolerance to like a drug or something like ethanol, for example? Well, maybe, but not really. I mean, the the tolerance is basically. I mean, yeah, it's somehow related. You are right. Let me let me rephrase this. So basically the tolerance is something that it happens to everybody and is when you consume something in a routine basis, mm -hmm. you get basically, we can say you get used to it. So then the same dose does not produce the same effect anymore. 
and then you need to increase the dose, right? So you're becoming tolerant. Um, uh, there are certain substances that are more, I will say they have this, uh, they are more easily you develop tolerance and others, it takes more time. The exact mechanism will depend on what we are talking. I mean, I think that in many cases, what is happening, there is a down regulation or up regulation of some receptors in your body. So then, uh, then you would need to produce more substance to actually produce the effect, right? But uh, it will depend. So for example, uh, in methadone, you may develop some tolerance, so then the dose must be increased. But mm -hmm. also when uh, when you are, uh, and that's the thing, in a steady state, somebody that is used to methadone may be, you know, require that. However, I think uh, normally they tend, I mean, I'm not a clinician, so I don't know exactly how they do the, tra the treatment, but in my understanding is like, they are starting with a dose with compensate the syndrome that they are having now. Right. And they are trying slowly by slowly, step by step, bringing that back down. So then you are going against the tolerance, like trying the mm. people basically to come up clean, right? And reducing that, and the tolerance is a very a very important issue because uh, we were saying in opioids is pretty easy to develop, and this is um, a condition that happens uh, in in some of the overdoses because a typical scenario would be somebody that is an opioid user and um, uh, whatever province has with the legal system and goes to prison right so he's in jail for a while and there no drugs can be used or you know, not as much as before. So basically, the people stop using opioids or in, in, in lower amount. And when get out, they continue using as they used before. But now mm -hmm. they're not tolerant anymore because the tolerance, you build it, but also you lose it. So then you are not tolerant anymore. You are taking the same dose that you did a few months ago, and now it's lethal to you. But right. it's not because you build that tolerance. But if you stop taking the drug, you will lose it. So then you have overdoses issue because of that. It's a it's a common it's a common situation because right, if people right. are not aware that this tolerance that you develop, you are always going to go back. It's a it's a reversible path. I mean, you go both directions, right? Mm. It's important. Okay. Right? Um, would you mind uh, talking a little bit about neurotransmitters as um, as we have been talking so much about opioids and um, cannabis and those seems to have a really direct effect. Um, would you mind el elaborating on that concept a little bit and how the dopamine and the GABA works in those cases? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, we are pure chemistry, right? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, our brain works with chemistry, right? Yeah. So we have mm -hmm. the neurotransmitters that we can say they are like messengers. They are messengers that help to communicate our neurons to do different things, depending on the part of the brain that we are talking about. So most of the drugs of abuse, we were saying before, they are psychoactive. So basically they are going to have a, a role, they are going to have an impact in the central nervous system. And how they do it, most of them, messing with the neurotransmitters, right? So depending on the drug, they may add on dopamine, on serotonin, in the GABA receptors. They can act at different levels, but basically they are going to mess with those levels. In many cases, what they are going to do is to produce a increase in, the, in these neurotransmitters. So for example, amphetamines and cocaine are pretty similar in that sense. And uh, if I remember correctly, both of them act uh, with the dopamine and the serotonin, and they're going to increase the levels of them. So you have an overstimulation. That's why they are stimulant drugs, right? Because basically you have more dopamine and serotonin than you should. That's why you are uh, with high stimulation. The mm. intimate me mechanism by which they do that is a little bit different. One prevents the neurotransmitters to be reabsorbed in the neuron, 
and the other one produces a major release of the neurotransmitter. So because I was saying before, the neurotransmitters are messengers that communicates neurons. So neurons are the cells we have in the brain, basically. And they are separated by a small gap that is called the synapses, right? So how they talk? Well, they release that messenger, the neurotransmitter in that gap, and then binds to certain receptors in the next neuron that tells get excited or get not excited. <laughs> and basically is that communication. And depending on the region of the brain, this will be a higher heart breathe, heart beat or breathing more quickly or not breathing or tremor or combustion, depend, all right? Or hallucinations, it depends. So the, the thing is that uh, with, the, for example, with the stimulant drugs, they increase the number of neurotransmitters in that gap. So they, the, the neurons are overstimulated, right? Uh, then, for example, with the GABA receptor, I think uh, GABA receptors are more the target of anxiolytic drugs, like the benzodiazepines. Anxiolytic that means that these are these uh, drugs that are used to reduce your anxiety, to calm down, right? So the GABA, I would say, is like a switch that makes everything to calm down in your brain. It's like a depressor, right? So it's a, that's why it's the therapeutic target for this kind of uh, uh, medication to, to make the people basically to be more cool and, and to, to be calm down, right? So uh, everything is, you see, is chemistry, uh, switch on, switch off, stimulation, depression, and depending on what you do, you, you will modify that accordingly. Mm. Okay, that, that, that makes a lot of sense, actually, how they both kind of work in reverse. Um, I guess I have another question about two things that I'm assuming work in reverse, and that's, um, I know it has a lot to do with opioids again, opioids again. So, uh, like, what are, like, uh, I guess, like, I don't know if I'm using the term right, but, like, anagus drugs and antagonist drugs? I don't know mm -hmm. if I'm using that term right. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, because that's the thing. We are talking about all these receptors. And many, many times how the drugs work, they bind to a receptor to produce an effect. So mm -hmm. the agonist is the one that binds and is going to produce that response. And the antagonist is the one that blocks that receptor, okay? So for example, when we talk about the opioids, right? Oh, the definitely. opioids are very dangerous uh, because they are the life-threatening, a effect they have is that they is make the people stop breathing. And this is how the, the most of the deaths by overdose happen because there is a big depression on the respiratory center that basically the brain tells the body to stop breathing, right? And obviously that's a fatal situation. Right. So this is because it's binding to a kind of opio a kind of receptor that if I remember correctly, are the mu receptors, right? And the opioids like the mu receptors, they bind there and they produce that effect. But you know that uh, it's being in the news that uh, is uh, encouraged and now it's easy to get an antagonist for that effect, that is the naloxone. So what does the naloxone do? Actually bind to that receptor, kicks out the opioid and avoid that to happen. It does not trigger that response of uh, the, producing the respiratory depression. So binds to the same receptor, but does not produce the effect. So when somebody is overdosing in opioids and all these mood receptors are active and are saying the brain, stop breathing, then the naloxone can see, basically gives like, <laughs> can they kick the opioids from the receptor, they bind and say, forget about that order. Just keep working normally right? Mm. So then uh, is the antagonist effect. So basically, this in the case of opioids is very dramatic because it's actually is a very good uh, antidote, right? In many, in many of the drugs, the antagonist is used an antidote, basically to reverse the, fest, the effects that the drugs produce in the body. Mm. Are these drugs that easily available? Sorry, completely off. Yeah, no, I mean, I I know, I remember reading about it, and like there was a, a different efforts at federal level and state level to have the Narcan 
easily available. So even at John Jay, I remember we had, there were a couple of events like basically encourage the people to be, to carry an ARCA with them on the back, just in case uh, something that you could be saving a life if you somebody uh, that with a possible opioid overdose. Uh, and uh, and the thing is that the Narcan is easily, uh, administration is very easy. You don't have to inject anybody, just put it on the nose and will be inhaled. Oh. So, mm. because that's the thing, I mean, I understand if you are walking around, you don't want to use a needle with somebody. I mean, you want to save a life, but right. it can be very awkward. Uh, but with the uh, in, inhalation form, is 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 easier and and, and though I think everybody will be ready to to do it. So but I feel like the people who use uh, opioids, they would also carry it so that when they are reaching that high, they would just take it to make sure that they don't die. Well, think about it. I mean, when I don't know, like maybe yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I you know, know this this knowledge most of me is from a theoretical point of view, but. What my what is my understanding is like what is this uh, what they call it the rush right when they inject the opioids is so strong that people is not that is not here anymore you oh. know it's they are not aware of what is happening your your mind is completely in another in another uh, dimension so you even if you are dying you are not realizing you are dying Dying. because you are so under the effect of the substance that you are not able to take any rational decision that's why it's encouraged especially if you know somebody or you're in a in a group that may these drugs can be used i think it's a very very good practice carry that with that with you you will recognize your friend going through that and you can save their lives. So yeah, mm. but the person itself is 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 very difficult because you are out of your mind in that moment. Right. So um I assume that with something like an and like the noxalone, you need that specific antagonist for that specific agonist slash um receptor combination. So like Noxone is not going to work on everything, I suppose. Only maybe only like I guess dopamine releasing opioids, I suppose. Well that that's, a, that's an excellent point. Yeah. That no that's that's an excellent point because that's uh, this is one important issue now as well because the, the fentanyl uh, is also being mixed in different parts of the country with another mm-hmm. depressant drug that is called silacine. Mm. But silacine acts in a different manner. So as you were saying, the naloxone doesn't work with silacine. So if mm. everybody having an overdose because uh, they were consuming a mixture of fentanyl and silacine, the naloxone will do the job for the fentanyl part because binds to the same receptors as morphine. But right. silacine, there's nothing you can do, right? So even you use huge amount of naloxone, it won't affect that. So yeah, they are very specific. They have to act exactly in the same re- receptor to have the, the same the, the the desired effect. Right. Mm. Go ahead, Nidhi. <laughs> uh, would you can you think of any cases where toxicology Perfect. was the missing piece to the puzzle? Like you said, it's like toxicology is all about like a puzzle you match things together you know what the metabolites mean so i've come across a case where tox was the thing rather than dna which is so frequently used but tox actually helped to understand the case better Mm -hmm. yeah i mean in general i will say toxicology information is critical in many settings and in post-mortem investigations it is because I'm not a forensic pathologist, of course, but it's my understanding that sometimes the findings in the autopsy, they are not very specific to any substance or any issue in particular, right? There is an edema in some of the organs or some general findings that may happen with many other things, but there is nothing that is pointing to a certain direction. So in that moment, 
the toxicology department always has a very, very close relation with pathology because looking for a certain substance or it's screening for, let's see what we get, and then finding what it was there, what were the concentrations, may help you tremendously to determine what was the cause of death. And definitely to be able, if you can do that, eh, eh, all this information from the death is helping the living because we'll tell you what substances are more dangerous, what are the concentrations you are found in, so that means if they are more or less potent, so definitely in a routine basis, toxicology in many, many cases is, is essential to understand why somebody died. So in, in that in that case, oh, there are obviously wound shot or other kind of causes of death that of course the toxicology may explain or give us a more information or what happened. Imagine in a in a car crash. We oh, can know yeah. if the person was under the influence of drugs, of alcohol, that may explain what, you know, causes the accident. Obviously, then the people died because of the crash and the trauma, but we can understand what were the elements that led to that situation. So in, in, this, in this sense, I think the toxicology is always giving um uh this kind of information or can solve the case in the case okay there are general findings in um related to an overdose but we don't know what happened and then you have the talks to explain okay was this combination of drugs that is very dangerous or in other kind of accidents can tell you you know what was the 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 substances that may have led to that situation mm. Probably we have time for one more question, and I'll let Julian. Oh, uh, all right. Um, I guess uh, I was wondering, like, what are some challenges that, like, a uh, forensic uh, toxicologist might encounter in the field? Many. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, no, I'm just laughing. I guess I think every field, right, guys? Every field has its own challenges and uh, um, right. uh, issues. In toxicology, I will say that lately the main challenge is how quickly the drug landscape is changing. Because think about it, for many years there were the classics, opioids, amphetamines, cocaine, some plants, some medicines, that's it. But then all the boom of the novel psychoactive substances, synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic opioids, cathinones, synthetic benzodiazepines. So the, now I think that there maybe I have the impression that it's getting to a more stable situation, but it's been crazy years. Like, I mean, hundreds of compounds, new compounds every other month, hundreds. And they, to keep up with that pace is difficult because how the work we do, for many of the work we do, we know it, we need what is called the reference material. So we know we can characterize that and then we can train our instrument to look for that specific right. one. Yeah. And doing our own methodology and everything to go for that compound. But all of a sudden, you don't have THC and, you know, and carboxy THC. Nowadays, you have the Delta 8, the Delta 10, the HHC. You have a huge array of different cannabinoids that they also the people get through internet. They go to the, they just click online and next day is at home with a variety <laughs> of drugs that you, that before it was more difficult to get. And it was like, I would say, a, a smaller catalog. And now it's, it's wide, right? So this is that, and this is a, a big challenge uh, for many, and many of them are very potent. So we have to target very, very low concentrations. So I would say this is one of our main challenges, how quickly the drug market is, is changing. Hmm. That makes sense because um, you have to sophisticate the instrumentation, change the essays and do all of that. So, exactly. I mean, to yeah. be able to keep pace, you know, uh, I mean, there are uh, amazing scientists in the field developing and the, the companies developing even more sophisticated instrumentation that you can 
screen for whatever and going to libraries that have thousands and thousands of compounds and you it's getting more sophisticated yeah. so the science is trying to keep up with the, the pace and is doing a good job but still you definitely need to keep updated you cannot just say oh i know toxicology and don't hear <laughs> Right. You have to read, you have to go to meetings, you have to understand what is happening because it's it's changing. Well, I I think we're good. I think we're good. Um we need to say it again. Because if we keep asking questions, then it goes for like two hours. Yeah, to so midnight. Yeah. To be very <laughs> precise and concise and like if we fit in the time. But this was so helpful. Thank you so much. And thank you for elaborating like this stupid definitions, but like no. such great depth no it is like we have studied this but we still keep asking because we keep forgetting it and i hope right uh, people who listen to the podcast but also um they will learn a lot so thank you thank you i hope thank you so yeah. much <laughs> thank you so much